Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to the uh, Board of Trustees meeting for the Utah Transit Authority. Today is Wednesday, August the 12th. I'm joined by my colleagues, Beth Holbrook and Kent Millington, and my name's uh, Carlton Christensen. We, uh, for, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's order, we're uh, streaming this meeting live uh, for the safety of all involved. And, a public comment was uh, that was previously received has been distributed, and likewise, we certainly welcome public comment on any items discussed or other matters pertaining uh, to UTA. Um, with that, we'll uh, go ahead and begin our meeting, and uh, with that, uh, we'll turn to uh, Sheldon Shaw, our safety director, in regards to our safety first minute. Uh, good morning, Sheldon. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, trustees. I appreciate the opportunity to give a safety message. Today, I chose um, being safe around traffic if you're a pedestrian. And the reason for that, there are about 6,000 fatalities a year in the United States of pedestrians that are struck and killed by vehicles. And the things you can do to make yourself safe are pretty common sense. If there's a sidewalk, use it. If you have to cross, go to a crosswalk. Um, use a signal. If it's nighttime, make sure that you're visible. Use a flashlight. All common sense things and, and just be hyper vigilant as you're as you're a pedestrian in and around traffic and unfortunately i bring that up because we had a police officer uta police officer who was struck last night um officer ravens was helping to try to corral a dog on state street who was off leash and trying to protect that animal and unfortunately she was struck and and transported to imc and the latest update i have is that she should have 100 percent recovery but that she's still in the hospital and so thanks for the opportunity chair and thank you, Sheldon, and certainly our thoughts and um, concern go toward the officer and their family, and, and we're sorry as well for the uh, lost animal. Um, we'll uh, then uh, go to our consent agenda, which includes approval of our minutes as well as some uh, complimentary transit passes for those members of the Attorney General's office that represent uh, UTA. With that, I'll look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, motion by Kent, seconded by Beth. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, the, any opposed? Uh, the motion passes. Um, our next item up is our agency report, and we welcome our Chief Operating Officer, Eddie Cummins, who's uh, filling in for our Executive Director and, and uh, Eddie's a regular on this uh, board meeting, but uh, we welcome you, Eddie. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to provide a quick update on August change day. As you know, change days are a lot of work, take a lot of effort, uh, but things are going extremely well. On August 23rd, we will be restoring 91% of our service, uh, which we reduced on uh, April 5th, 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the upcoming service adjustments target improvements for those who need our service the most. Several routes will receive improvements beyond our uh, pre-COVID levels, uh, while service on some routes will remain reduced or suspended based on ridership, demand, and financial resources. In regards to communication, we continue to share our August change day information with our riders, partners, and the community. Uh, some of our communication efforts include a press release, information on our website, rider and partner communications, and information will be shared on our social media channels as change day approaches. Uh, all route specific information for August change day can be found on our website at rideuta.com. And that concludes my uh, report for today. Any questions? Um, yeah, Eddie, I just had one question and that was, um, uh, you know, during the uh, reduction in service, um, uh, riders had, uh, in, uh, you know, a, a schedule that I think for the most part they were working three days and then doing other stuff uh, in the remaining two. With the um, uh, expansion of service or, or the return of service, are, are most of the operators basically uh, working or driving for the full 40 hours or how has that turned out as they've gone through that bidding process? Yes, yeah, so it'll be very close. Uh, you know, what we'll be reducing likely is overtime. You know, in the past, we did leverage overtime, you know, quite a bit, you know, creating 10-hour shifts or having people come in and fill shifts. 
things like that. So I think what we'll see is we'll see the vast majority of our operators work in their normal full-time schedule, um, but we'll, we will see reduced overtime. Okay. Let me, uh, Beth, you look like you have a question. I do, thank you. Um, Eddie, I was just curious as to um, some of the increases that we have done on some of our routes um, as a result of doing this analysis had different times. And so does that have different times of, I guess, being super busy that those routes had to have either extra buses or some other component. Has that factored in? Like, how does that, how does all of that work? Maybe you could just kind of articulate that really quickly. Yes, we took all that into consideration. You know, as, as we've reported uh, several times to the board, we were actually monitoring ridership daily to see what was going on, what was happening. And our service planning department, our operations planner took that into consideration. Uh, when creating this plan, and that's really what led to, you know, some of the routes receiving more uh, more service than what they had originally. Thank you. So I think that I'll just continue on just a little bit, but, uh, you know, we're going to continue to watch this. You know, we think we have a really, really good plan. We think this meets the needs of the community, but we're going to continue to watch and see what ridership does. And then we'll be prepared to make adjustments as necessary. Like I've said many, many times, the key to this whole thing is being flexible and agile and, and willing to change when we need to. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Eddie this morning on this topic? Eddie, thank you. Uh, thanks for filling in. Thank you. They did a great job. Um, well, next, uh, item number 5A is, was a resolution uh, in a, on an agreement with Salt Lake City, and we um, some aspects of that uh, had to be uh, re-looked at, and it will come back to us at a later time, and we'll currently table that item. Uh, that takes us to item 6, which is a discussion item on our Depot District Clean Fuels Technology Center project update. And, and this is an important project that's been underway and uh, complicated, probably to say the least. But with that, we'll turn to our Chief Service Development Officer, uh, Mary DeLoretto, and uh, I understand she'll be joined by David Osborne. Good morning, Mary. Good morning. Good morning, trustees. Um, yeah, for folks who have been here at FLHQ, you'll see that there's a lot of progress going on on the West parking lot and on the um, wash building that's being constructed under the viaduct out there, out back. And we're getting ready to move on to the next phase, which will be the new admin and maintenance buildings. And so we thought this would be a good time to give you a project update of where we're at and the schedule and things like that. Um, in the next few weeks, you'll see we'll be coming back with a contract mod to get phase three going. But this is just today, we're just gonna give you an update. And David Osborne is the project manager for this project. And so he's going, I'm gonna turn it over to him. And we're also joined by Gray Turner, who um, has more history than David. David's only been here since about January, I believe. So any harder questions, Gray is also available to help answer those. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David to give you his presentation. Thanks, Mary. Thanks everyone. We're excited to be here and to to talk about this project a little bit and give an update so that everybody's aware of what's going on and what's happening. Uh, on this first slide here, you can see this is a rendering of what the, this will be the front of the new admin building. Um, and the facility in its initial phase when, when it first opens will be capable of handling 150 buses um, with the possibility of expanding to up to a 250 bus uh, capacity. Um, could we go to the next slide? So we've had several phases already, and this first phase is already completed, and that was uh, demolition and abatement of the old building, the old locomotive building. Um, so that's uh, been taken care of. It's all done. If you look out behind FLHQ, there's not anything there anymore. Um, so can we go to the next slide? This is the phase that we're working on right now, and construction is underway, and Mary already mentioned this a little bit, but the the work in the west parking lot is going on. Um, we're also working on the wash building that's out underneath the viaduct. And then the, the other component of that is the new fueling island. Um, and that's on, kind of on the far south end of the project um, that you can see there highlighted in, in green. And I have a few pictures if we can go to the next slide. This, this, the construction on this is anticipated to last until approximately February of next year, 2021. 
And here's a few pictures uh, of starting out with the fueling island. Um, there on the left, you can see that's a lar that large concrete pad. That's the containment area where the uh, the new above ground fuel tanks will will rest. And then on the right side, that is the the driveway and where the tankers will offload fuel to fill the tanks. Um, and also white fleet vehicles will be able to fuel uh, in as and come through there and fuel. Can we go to the next slide. This is a, a couple of pictures of the wash building. Uh, you can see it's right there underneath the viaduct. Um, and work's progressing on that. They actually have most of the roof done now. These pictures are a couple of weeks old, uh, but they are moving forward and, and getting a lot done. You can see it's got two bays in it. The one bay will be equipped with a, wa a wash right now as a part of this project. And then there's a future bay that could have a wash installed in it in the future for future use as we expand and add more buses. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are some pictures of the West parking lot. And again, if you've looked outside recently, that's probably even looks a little bit different now uh, because these are a couple of weeks old. The picture on the left is um, looking back towards FLHQ. And you can see here, uh, there, that's one of the median areas that will be out in the parking lot. You can even see a, a light pole foundation and some other things. One interesting thing to, to note on this is you can see there's a little opening in the curb. Uh, a lot of the island areas there in the parking lot are going to serve as uh, stormwater uh, retention and cleaning. So they'll be depressed. So as the water runs off the pavement, it'll run into those areas, be stored for a little bit, run through kind of a grassy landscaped area to help improve the water quality on that. So that's a nice feature of that's been incorporated into the landscaping. And the other picture on this is uh, you can see that's a, a large vault uh, that's been installed. Uh, we are undergrounding a lot of the power. You can see in the other picture uh, a power pole there. Um, so in order for the parking to happen, we need to remove most of the power poles and have the power service go underground. And so we've been working on that, working with Rocky Mountain Power to get that finalized and that re make that relocation happen. Can we go to the next slide? So this is, as Mary mentioned, this is the next phase of the project. And this is the one where we'll be coming back here in a few weeks uh, to talk about the change order uh, on this. We're working right now with our contractor, finalizing the pricing and, and other things for the contract on that. Um, and the construction on this is slated to start this fall. We are working right now with Salt Lake City on a building permit. Um, and they've been getting some comments over to the contractor and the designer to address and to look at. Uh, but this phase will be the new maintenance uh, and admin building, um, as well as the bus parking area. And then uh, on the top of the page there, that is a uh, detention pond where the stormwater from the site will run and be detained before it goes into the existing storm drain system. Uh, so we're looking about a 28-month construction schedule on this, so it should be completed the first part of 2023. We go to the next slide. And we do have a, some future phases uh, on this as well. Um, we'll be building some canopies for the buses. Um, another uh, key feature that we'll have on the project is some electric bus charging. Um, we do have a few electric buses right now and we'll be getting more and we're gonna be incorporating that into the site uh, to charge those buses. And then the other item that we have is potentially some a solar component. And this would occur uh, most likely in 2022, uh, but it would, it'll happen in conjunction with that phase three so that hopefully everything would be completed there the first part of 2023 and ready for use. Uh, can we go to the next slide? This is a, just a picture. Uh, it's a rendering of a, an idea that something that might be able to be used for the electric charging. Um, so the buses would be underneath the canopies and there'd be a pantograph that would come down and, uh, and charge the buses that way. Um, you, you may have seen across the tracks, there's a couple of high powered chargers right now that we are using. And so a similar type of idea with a pantograph that would come down and charge the bus. Next slide. So we have had some cost increases on this project and we wanted to, to talk about that today and some of the reasons for those cost increases. 
Um, right now and over the past several years, there's been really strong construction demand. Uh, there's a lot of great big projects that are going on, billions and billions of dollars being spent around the state, uh, both in the private and public sector. Um, we've got Facebook, Google, the airport is a, is a huge project um, that's, that's using a lot of resources. The prison, um, UDOT is doing a lot of work, uh, several large design build projects that are in process right now. Um, and so there's a lot of competition for skilled labor and materials uh, to get construction work done. And so that's driven uh, some inflation is higher than uh, a little bit higher than what we would normally want to see. Um, and so that's driven some of the cost increases. This project's been going on for a few years. Um, and so that's one of the things. Can we go to the next slide? Um, in conjunction with that on the project, we've there's been a few things that have been done that we are uh, wanted to discuss or, or talk about. There was actually a, a design workshop last fall as we went through to finalize the design and of the, the new maintenance and admin building. Um, and we, as we mentioned earlier, initially the, the facility will be able to accommodate 150 buses and that can be expanded as the bus numbers increase. Um, and as we looked at, as that was looked at, um, building a smaller building that would only accommodate the 150 buses initially just wasn't practical for several reasons. Um, the overall site layout, it's a relatively small site for what we're putting on onto the site and the use that we'll be have on there. Um, I guess another way to look at it is it'll be a very efficient site uh, because there's just not lots and lots of area. And so one of the things that happens with that is on that new building, it's, it's a long, the maintenance building is a longer building that stretches, if you saw on the earlier maps, from south to north. And there's not, based on where it sits on the site, there's not really room to expand to the, to the north because that's where FLHQ is. And on the south, that'll be the entrance for all the buses. And so the buses, as they come in for service, will enter in on the south side of the building and then they'll turn into the bays that are on the east and west sides. And so uh, it, there was some options that were looked at and discussed to uh, potentially build part of the building and then try and expand it to the south. And for a lot of reasons that just wasn't economical. Um, it just makes it made it really difficult in order to continue to have the buses circulate through there uh, for service. As you can imagine, if the buses enter in on the south and we're trying to expand the south side of the building, it makes it really difficult to do. Um, and along with that, on some of the systems with the building, it's just more economical and more, more uh, functional to design those systems to be what they need to be from, from the get-go. Uh, structural systems, the roofing, uh, the foundations, um, the heating and ventilation systems, plumbing, electrical. Um, so if if we had done a smaller building, then trying to expand that would necessitate either building those systems to accommodate everything, to accommodate the larger building at the beginning, or uh, coming back and, and changing and removing some of those systems. Uh, the other thing that we've, we've looked at and talked about and that was discussed uh, last fall as this happened is uh, the expansion. Uh, and right now, it's looking like we'll be expanding and having more buses, uh, potentially up to 200 plus within five to six years of the facility opening. And so it just felt like based on that, that it made the most sense to construct the building to the size that it needed to be for full future use at this time rather than doing a project and then three or four years later coming back and doing another project that'd be very disruptive to operations. Could we go to the next slide? Um, another thing that's added some, some cost is adding that electrical bus charging. Uh, right now our estimated uh, construction cost on that is approximately $3.7 million. Um, so that, that's one thing. A couple of other things that we did on the building, just as in anticipation of that future use, is um, initially the thought was in those future bays that we wouldn't put in the concrete floor. We just put in some asphalt. We wouldn't put in the radiant floor heat um, or any of those things. And it was decided that, again, it's just more economical when you look at inflation and all the other things that are going on 
to build that and and to put that concrete in now. So those areas will be ready, and as as expansion happens or as more buses are acquired, you can add the equipment into those bays, and they should be ready to go. Uh, one other thing that that happened, and there was some some discussion on this amongst uh, the the group and uh, operations and others. Uh, there are some other transit agencies around the country that are starting to use and to implement double double decker buses, and so uh, it was decided after discussion and and work through that to look at uh, making the buildings maybe a little bit taller and increasing the the door opening and putting on larger doors, just so that we don't. Uh, that's an option that we would have in the future. Uh, this facility will have a design life of 40 plus years. And so felt like it was a, a good decision to make to, to try and make sure that we had thought of any possible future uses and tried to anticipate that and plan for that. Some other items that we've had come up as we've been in construction, and we know there'll be some more of this as we go through this next phase to build that new maintenance and admin building. The site has been well used over the over the years. There's been a lot of uh, other facilities here, a lot of other buildings, a lot of other uses. And so we've come across a lot of things uh, in the ground as we've excavated. There's been uh, old foundations and footings that need to be removed uh, to make way for the new utilities and new foundations and, and the new items of work that are being constructed. Uh, there's been, there are contaminated soils on site and those have needed, those need to be disposed of properly. Um, so we've had some of that that we've had to deal with and there'll be more of that. Um, some other things, just an, an example of something else that we encountered was there was a, as a contractor was uh, digging to install a new water line, they came across an old, it's a was a really large uh, under uh, propane tank that they had to expose and, and remove from the ground and have people come out, make sure there wasn't anything in it and then dispose of that tank. And so so there's been some things that we've had to do as far as uh, kind of some cleanup there on the site. Uh, and that'll probably continue on for the remainder of the project. So, can we go to the next slide? Um, so just a, a budget summary of, of where we're at right now. So the phase one, that's the building demolition and the abatement. Uh, that was a two and a half million dollars. Uh, that's completed. Phase two, which is under construction right now, that's the, the west parking lot, the fueling island, and the bus wash building. Uh, that's a $9.3 million construction cost. That's ongoing uh, through the remainder of this year and the first part of next year. Uh, next slide, please. Then phase three, that'll begin this fall. As I said, we're working on the building permit and working on the contract for this. Um, that's the maintenance and administration building and the bus parking. And right now, the number that we have from the contractor is approximately $50.3 million for that, uh, for the construction. Uh, we did do an independent cost estimate on that. Uh, that uh, so they went through and verified those costs and looked at that. Um, now that $50.3 million does not include soft costs or uh, contingency. So could we go to the next slide? So those soft costs are roughly 11.6 million, and that is our, our design costs, materials testing. Um, we're buying uh, some bus lifts. Um, we have our own internal costs, utility work and connections that happen separate from what the contractor's doing. Um, so that'd be some of the work that, for example, we looked at how we're gonna be undergrounding the power there. Our contractor will put in all of the conduits and vaults and other things but then rocky mount power comes back and they pull through all the wiring and they connect everything up and so there's costs associated with that and that's an example of what those utility connections would be and um, we've had some environmental inspections and other things that happen on the site associated with the contaminated soil and also as some of these older foundations and other things are exposed we um, look at those from a historical perspective and make sure that uh, you know we're documenting and doing the things that we need to before those are removed um, there's also furniture for the new building uh, right away. Uh, and those are some examples of what some of those soft costs are. Um, we'll also have a contingency of approximately $6 million. And that's just based off of a percentage of construction. Um, there's an additional $1.5 million in contingency included in the phase three construction cost. And so we've tried to put some contingency in there to plan for some of these unknowns like 
the contaminated soil and uh, things that we come across that need to be removed, foundations, old propane tanks, things like that. Uh, could we go to the next slide? So the future phases uh, that was on that the map or the diagram that we showed earlier, those things that are we're working on completing here in conjunction with phase three would be the electric bus charging. Um, the estimated cost on that is approximately 3.7 million. Um, we do have some uh, VW settlement money that we'll be able to apply towards that, approximately $1.7 million. That'll help offset some of the cost there. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other item that we have in here, and it has has been in the project and something that's we're, we've been has been discussed and, and looked at in the past is a solar component to the project. And that would be either on the canopies or on the maintenance and admin building or both. Um, and so some of the budgetary numbers that we had for, for an estimated construction cost on that are approximately $4 million. Now this is something that it could be deferred or you know, if we wanted even eliminated um, from the project. Um, initially, it was looked at as maybe a way to do a form of a microgrid uh, that could help fund part of the project. Uh, that did not work out, um, and so that's not happening. Um, we looked at, uh, we've looked at, um, I did a look at kind of the return on investment on that, and just based on the amount of the estimated amount of energy that the panels would generate versus how much energy costs per kilowatt hour. Um, initially, I thought it was about a 10 to 12 year return on investment, but I think it's probably more like a 20 year return on investment. And so just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. We haven't really done a lot of design on this uh, yet, <clears throat> but it had been something that we had talked about and had been on the discussed and as, as a part of the project. Um, on the electrical side, we are working right now with Rocky Mountain Power on our current and future power needs. There may be some costs associated with that. Uh, we're having them do a study. As you can imagine, one of the things that really drives our power needs for the project is the electric bus charging. And so as we add that in, it's, it's a, a significant power draw and so we're working with our designers right now to estimate what that power draw is going to be so that we can get with Rocky Mountain Power and have them take a look at how, they're, how they will feed the site and get us all the power that we need. Can we go to the next slide? Um, another thing that we have that's in the future is the canopies. And our estimated construction cost on those is approximately seven and a half million dollars. Um, so that'd be the bus canopies. Um, we may need to, uh, the, we may need to house some of the charging equipment on the canopies. Um, just based on the site constraints and uh, there, there's some large cabinets and other things that come along with the charging infrastructure. And so right now our estimated total future construction costs after this phase three, which is the maintenance and admin building is $15.2 million. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, this is a, a summary of our grants that we have right now. Our current uh, grants that we have uh, to help fund the project are approximately $29.5 million. Um, we are estimating some future um, grant money that would be available for the project of approximately $7.4 million for a total of $36.9 million. Can we go to the next slide? And so right now we're scheduled for completion in early 2023, um, which is a little bit later than what was originally scheduled or originally anticipated. And some of the reasons for that schedule change is uh, originally the old locomotive building was going to be repurposed. Um, and uh, the contractor uh, came to UTA with a proposal to demolish that building and build a new building to have some cost savings. And that was approximately a nine month uh, delay in schedule. And then as we went to get our permit, our building permit for the previous the phase that we're working on right now with the wash building and the fueling island in the west parking lot, uh, there was a delay in, in getting that permit. Um, and that was another three months. And so we're, we're delayed about a year. Um, but right now, the contractor schedule is showing completion in early 2023. 
I believe that's the last slide. And so wanted to open it up for any questions that anybody might have or any other discussion that we would want to have on this. Yeah, I, guess, I, I, have, a, I have a question. Uh, when we're talking about uh, building this uh, facility and we're going to build uh, to the capacity of 250 because it's more efficient to do it now rather than add on later, mm -hmm. are we doing the same thing for the uh, operator facilities in the admin building? Uh, are we looking forward and uh, making adequate space for the operators to have their uh, rest facilities, uh, lunch rooms, those kinds of things, are they being adequately prepared for the 250 bus capacity? Yes. So they're going to be included in the admin building construction sufficient to handle the 250 potential buses that will eventually be there? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. David, I had a couple of questions. Um, thank you for your presentation, by the way. That's really, really helpful to kind of get a uh, perspective on on how this is this is coming about. Um, you talked a couple of questions, a couple of things about phases four, five, and six, and how mm -hmm. some of that incorporated the um, the overhead charging stations. Yes. How many does that? How many stations does that include in that phase, whatever phase that ends up being? That's an excellent question. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. It would initially include charging for 30 buses. 30, okay. Because I know that we had had dialogue about um, facilities and, and the overall kind of goal, if you will, is to have like a third, a third, a third, mm -hmm. a third CNG, a third diesel, and a third electric. And I'm just wondering how that looks. So thank you, that's great. Um, another question that I had is um, on, the solar panel, so the microgrid component, is that because it, it, you said it didn't ROI until about 20 years out as opposed to the 10 to 13 that you thought it would. Um, is that because of electricity costs? Is it because of other components that are market driven or is it just because of the flat, no no pun intended on the panel, um, is that just the flat costs that are, are associated with that? So the way that I looked at that was I just looked at the estimate for the cost of the panels and how much power they would generate a year based on and then the cost of power per uh, kilowatt hour. Uh, it didn't factor in any other types of funding or uh, incentives or anything like that. It was purely it was a pretty simple analysis based just on those couple of things. Okay, thanks. And I did want to comment too that I really appreciate that you looked at the right sizing potentials and took into those took into account those variabilities of, of should we build it the way that we need it now or into the future. And I, I I applaud you. I think that that's it's always wise to make sure you understand all the ramifications of that, including the cost. So thank you, David. That brings up another question that I had. Uh, about the solar panels, how much power were those solar panels designed to produce? Do you remember? Uh, let me look and see right now. Looks like annually they would produce approximately 2 million kilowatt hours. And that would be for if we were to put them on the canopies as well as the uh, maintenance and admin building. Okay. 2 million kilowatt hours uh, for the $4 million installation cost? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, a couple questions for you. Um, the first one's more of a joke, and that is, did the propane tank end up as a refurbished above ground pool in Gray Turner's backyard? <laughs> Almost, but not quite. It, it okay. didn't happen. Okay. I, He's, he's so in, uh, uh, he had such a genius there. I figured he figured out a secondary use for it. But um, uh, on a more serious note, uh, do you feel like at any point in the project that um, and I, and I've asked this question a couple times and and so far I've, I I feel fine. But uh, do you feel like there's anything sort of that uh, folks considered essential in the project for it to be successful long term? That we're omitting uh, due to cost and 
and those are always hard decisions because there's a lot, usually a pretty long want, want list, and, and then there's the core needs list, and I, I'm encouraged by the future additions in the maintenance building and stuff that look at long-term needs, but I just wondered if there's anything that we're really sort of putting on hold at this point. I don't think so. Um, actually, we looked through some of the value engineering proposals that we had on the project, things that were incorporated, and a lot of the value engineering was, I mean, an example of kind of a big thing that they did on the value engineering was to change the, there's that main driveway that goes down the middle of the building. And at one point that was radiant floor heat, and that was changed to a different type of more economical heating for that. The bays are still the radiant floor heat. Um, and so that was a savings, but it doesn't, it didn't necessarily affect the long-term functionality of the building. Um, you know, landscaping, some things along those lines, but there really wasn't anything that was necessarily changed that said, okay, let's, let's only build part of this right now. And then we'll have to, you know, there'll be a lot of big expense in the future. Um, like I said, the building itself, it's really should be mostly ready to accommodate extra buses. It would just be purchasing some additional bus lifts and equipment. So does well, did that answer your question, Carlton? No, it very much did. And, you know, equipment and those things you don't want to buy till you're ready to use it. Cause there's yeah. probably a new, newer and better version of it uh, when that time comes. I, 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 I did want to maybe circle back on the question on the solar piece and and, um, you know, of course, I've been in Salt Lake City for a long time, but I know they and even Salt Lake County have had a big focus on renewable energy. And um, and sometimes, it, you know, it, it's more cost effective to buy into a larger project somewhere else and, and benefit from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes, you know, you're just as well off putting it on your own um, on project and some of it's a logistics question um, in addition to sort of just the simple cost and return piece and I just wondered what kind of dialogue um, has gone on along on that line um, as we contemplate that decision. Um, that's probably something where we could have some more dialogue. Um, like I said as part of this I really wanted to focus on what the costs were um, and then kind of share what I had discovered on the return on investment on that and present that information. But I recognize that there are other factors that play into that. Like you said, just uh, wanting to be a part of uh, renewable energy and, and trying to be green and, and environmentally friendly. Um, those are also obviously considerations that go into that. Um, one thing that we are planning on doing is as we have these future meetings with Rocky Mountain Power to discuss our full power needs for the site, including the electric bus charging. I did ask them the next time if they could uh, have their solar person come to that meeting. So hopefully we could discuss a couple of those, a couple of the issues of how maybe we could incorporate that onto the site um, and how that would work. Um, so I think it's still something that we definitely can consider. I just wanted to make everybody aware of kind of the cost implications sure. and, and what we would the offset on that as far as the power that would be produced. No, I mean, I think that it is ought to be a robust and complete discussion and uh, Rocky Mountain Power may have some great suggestions for us and mm -hmm. and, and even our contractor designers might. Um, um, I, I, I just would hate to sort of sh sh shut it out totally without looking at the broader sort of public discussion and but having all that information is going to really be helpful in that yeah. conversation. So, we'll uh, continue. We'll continue to look at that and provide future updates on that. Okay. And you then my last. Oh. oh, go ahead, Carlson. You've got another question. Oh yeah, my my last question was, um, and um, there was uh, some discussion about, uh, and I think Eddie may have mentioned it in the a recent meeting to us, but there was some discussion about whether or not. You know, the service, you know, assuming things got better in a couple of years, uh, there was some discussion about uh, this facility being done and, and, and us being able to provide any additional service, any additional bus service over what we're currently doing. 
uh, do we feel like between whatever we're planning for Meadowbrook and and this facility that the timing of any completion is going to coincide with additional service beyond our current levels? Ooh, that is one that I don't totally know the answer to. Gray or Mary, is that something that you would? Yeah, yeah we, we are expanding Meadowbrook in anticipation of maybe buses coming in before um, this depot district is ready. So we will have additional capacity. I believe it's 20 or 24 bus capacity over at Meadowbrook, which is ongoing right now, that design. Um, so I think we do have that capacity. And we don't know, as you mentioned, sure. what service will be and how many more buses we'll need. But based on our um, plan right now, we believe, and as David said, in five to six years, we would want to start the expansion for those additional buses. But right now, I think we're good. Okay. And uh, 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 Kent, you had a question. Yeah, going back to the uh, solar installation, are we going to need to have uh, some kind of battery storage for the solar overnight because most of the buses will be uh, be charged overnight. I'm assuming. Yes, that's How an excellent question. How are we going question. to capture and, and retain the solar power uh, to be able to to uh, charge those buses overnight? So, so right now, what we'd be looking at on the solar would be without battery any battery storage it would be to to handle daytime operations of the buildings um as far as batteries go we've we've been we've done some looking into that right now it's really expensive to do the battery storage right. um, from a perspective of purchasing the batteries as well as you know ground space and, and a place to put those batteries right. and so it's something that we've looked at right now it's really really expensive um, and so if we were to do the, the solar, it would be mostly to, to do the daytime things and then the, the nighttime uh, charging would need to come off of uh, the power power. Power. And, and it, it would I... also probably be net metering because that's, we mm -hmm. have solar at our house. So at night, you know, we use electricity, but during the day, if we're not using it, it goes back into the grid and we get credit for it. So we okay. probably could have some arrangement like that as well. Yeah, and if, right. and if I could jump in, um, Trustee Millington, this is Gray Turner. Um, this is something that um, it was dis it was mentioned in the presentation with a microgrid. Um, that was a discussion that we had with some other um, companies um, previously to look at a microgrid to you know the, the battery capacity and storage would allow us um, to to be you know be on our own grid to be able to collect the power and store it in the batteries. Um, there'd be, it's a pretty large battery capacity that we would need. And we've also sure, found yeah. that it would also uh, require a couple of diesel, um, or we're looking at CNG generators to help generate that power during the day so that it could be used at night. So uh, there's still some more discussions in our, in our discussions and, and we've actually got some projects, uh, some research projects going between uh, Rocky Mountain Power and Utah State University to help look at some of those uh, those needs and those um, th those future cap capabilities. And so we haven't ruled it out completely, but but as David mentioned, it is a it is a significant cost. And do with the budget constraints we've got right now, we've we're looking at scaling that back um, right now and just you know looking at the the cost of the panels. All right, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Uh, any remaining questions from the board? No, oh, great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, David uh, and Mary and Gray, thank you uh, for that information. We will look forward to your return on the on the contract piece of that, and and, and probably the subsequent budget discussion as well associated with that. So. Thank you. Um, so if I could, if I could just add oh yeah, uh, another minute. Uh, for one, I do. I, I want to publicly compliment David uh, as the project manager. He's doing a phenomenal job. Um, this is a large, complicated project. It's not a project that we typically do uh, as far as building buildings. So he's done a great job of coming in and doing that. Um, but one thing I did want to comment is also give some props out to um, to Lauren Simpson. Um, and his staff, as you meant, as David mentioned in this design threat that we had back in the fall, and and, trust, and Chairman, you mentioned, you know, have we have we cut out anything essential? 
um, and, and how is that going to affect our people? Lauren and his staff, both maintenance and admin, have been very closely involved with this. Um, they, they've had a, a very um, big hand in evaluating, you know, value engineering uh, ideas that have come up. Um, what we, you know, the, the difference between a want and a need. Um, you know, we don't want to short them, but we also don't want to build the Taj Mahal. And so they've been very, very instrumental in, in getting us to where we're at and have been very helpful. So I just want to make sure that, uh, that we appreciate their assistance and their involvement. And it's truly is a team effort to get to where we're at and where we're going to be going. Great. Uh, great point. Thank you, Greg. And uh, again, thanks, David, Mary, uh, for your update. We'll look forward uh, to the subsequent conversation. Um, with that, uh, it draws a conclusion to our uh, fairly short meeting today. Uh, we would note that our next meeting will be uh, on Wednesday, August the 26th at 9 a.m. Um, I'll ask for a motion for adjournment. Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn. Second. Motion by Kent, uh, Beth, seconded by Kent. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we will stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to staff and others to make today's meeting possible. Yes, thank you, everyone.